All right, everybody. So hopefully you listened to our two-parter of episode 100 uh, with our four special guests. It was a great time uh, making those episodes. Uh, we had a lot of fun, right, Wayne? Indeed. It was fantastic just getting to connect with our uh, our guests from the past and, you know, just talk about some stuff that you know, was important to us. Yeah. Yeah. And it's... Uh... Uh, it got weird in some in some cases. Some of the movies we we talked about. Obviously, we had a huge Star Wars conversation in Episode One. Um, I'm sure a lot of people enjoyed that one because that covers a lot of things. I don't know, man. I said some pretty controversial things, so we'll see. <laughs> we'll see if we get any hate mail. Respectfully, um, though, it's you know the thing. It's just like that line from Goodfellas. You know why they carried my mother's groceries all the way home? It was out of respect. Yes. Got to be respectful <laughs> with your opinions. Just because you don't agree with something. Exactly, for sure. Um, All right, so this week we're going to talk about a director who I think uh, gets a lot of flack, and I think um, some of it's deserved, some of it's not. It just depends on on, uh, how you look at him. And that's uh, Academy Award-winning director Ron Howard, who has been in Hollywood since he was a wee little lass, a young child. Um, I believe he was a lad, but... Oh, sorry, lad. (laughs) My bad. A wee little lad. Um, and he, uh, you know, made his way. He was doing really successful at acting. Uh, he transitioned from TV in the film. And then uh, in 1977, he decided that he was basically done with acting and wanted to make be a filmmaker. And that was when he made Grand Theft Auto. Now, I haven't seen that one. So I love that happened. game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, nothing to do with the game. Uh, but that was his first for- foray into directing and obviously it struck a chord with him sure and we're gonna probably stay away from his acting because we all know he starred as the little boy in andy griffith and yeah obviously happy days and um yes american graffiti yes a fine actor but yeah we're gonna really focus on this is a discussion about ron howard the director not the actor not the producer not the writer he also uh like i you know we were talking before wayne before you know know i gotta say it don't you go ahead ronald howard the director (laughs) <laughs> um, i had to it's like you know one of those rules you, you have to uh it he had a little bit of a uh, hand in goodwill hunting which we've talked about as being one of my favorite movies of all time he was the director that they showed the initial script to and he told them that they that was back when it was like a drama slash spy thriller and he told them they had to pick a direction and they did and they created one of the most classic films in my opinion um and he had a lot to do with that. So I think, you know, again, just a guy who's had a lot to do with the history of film uh, since it began, you know, not since it began, but since he began in it. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's a, just an important notation to make. Uh, Cause again, I, he can be very much uh, a malign director, if you will. People will pick on him a lot, I think. Um, but let's get started here. We're going to, you know, before we get started, I'm going through IMDb right now. How many did you see? It's like, Oh, he directed that too. Shit. I've gotten there's, like three so far. There's there's quite a few. He's definitely one of those directors, which may, it's a very weird uh, career when you look at his directing style because he didn't stick to one genre. He started out kind of as a com- comedy director, as he did Grand Theft Auto, uh, Night Shift, Michael Keaton, and uh, and um, um, what's his name, uh, Henry uh, Winkler, Fonda, <laughs> Fonda, Fonda. Uh, no, I think Fonda was it. Wasn't he in Cocoon? Um, I was going to say the great comedy that is Cocoon. Yeah, Cocoon. He did Splash. One of my favorite comedies, Wayne, and it's kind of, a, it was not very well reviewed, uh, but it was from that same time was Gun Ho. Absolutely. You talk Michael Keaton and you bring up Gun Ho and people look at you cross-eyed. It's like, yeah. it's a great movie. It's about American ingenuity and we can do anything anybody else can do. Rah, 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 rah. <laughs> yes. It's it's a film about uh, a, like a American car company that has to that gets bought out by a Japanese company, and they have to work learn how to work together. Um, and obviously, the Americans are very much hard set against that until finally they you know they need each other. And it's a really like it's a it's funny. It's a great story. Uh, it's got a great cast. It's got Michael Keaton, George Went, um, Getty is, Wantanabe. Yes, exactly. That's yes. all you need to know in the eighties. Boom. And it, it was one of those movies too, Wayne. It was on TV so much, I just assumed that it was like a ma- this massive hit of a film that I just didn't get to see in theaters. And then you go back and you look, and it didn't do very well. And yeah. 
So one thing we need to bring up when we're talking about Ron Howard, there's a pretty good chance we're going to see the amazing, the wonderful, the legend Clint Howard as well. Yes. But did you know there's also a third Howard brother named Rance? Actually, no, Rance, I don't know if he's a brother or not. No, Rance is their father. Father, that's what yes, it is. Rance, Rance and Clint were basically in all of Ron's movies. I, unfortunately, Rance passed away somewhat recently. Um, but that's a good, yeah, he always gave work to his family. Um, obviously, everybody knows his daughter, Bryce Dallas Howard. She's a wonderful actress who's uh, recently uh, taken to directing. Go ahead, Wayne. I did not know that that was a relation. I never drew that connection. You didn't know Bryce Dallas Howard I was his daughter? I did not draw that connection. Wow. I'm going to go that's sit in the corner and let you finish this because I have no authority to write the like That's a shocking, it's almost as shocking as JT not watching Heathers before. Um, maybe even more so. It, uh, yeah, so that, that that's, I think, how, you know, obviously everyone talks about nepotism, but when you go into Hollywood, I, I get annoyed with that on Twitter because when you go to Hollywood, there's so many people that are related to each other that it's just, it, it's almost like if you were a car mechanic and your dad was a car mechanic and your mom and your grandpa was a car mechanic, you know, it's that kind of Hollywood has become become that type of thing where you just get into it at that certain point. It's not nepotism because I'm not using my famous father's last name. Yeah. <laughs> I'm using his real name. <laughs> my famous uncle's last name. Um, or so, just my middle name is my last name. You know. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> So we um, are getting a little off track there, but it, I did not know that Wayne did not know that they were related. But yes, that is his daughter. And she has directed a couple episodes of the Star Wars uh, TV shows now. Um, so she's making her way into directing. I think it's probably not long before we get a movie out of her. But, you know, you you go you look at his first uh, four or five movies. They're all comedies. They're all funny that <laughs> half of them star Michael Keaton. And then you get to uh, 1988. And you get this interesting sci-fi fantasy film uh, known as Willow, starring the uh, legendary Val Kilmer and, of course, Warwick Davis, uh, one of my favorites because he played Leprechaun. But, you know, he's also in Star Wars and Harry Potter and stuff. But he's Leprechaun, everybody. Um, you know, written by George Lucas, uh, like directed by Ron Howard, starring Val Kilmer, Joanne Whaley, uh, Warwick Davis, Gene Marsh, just one of those films again from our childhood, Wayne, that has really struck a chord is getting a a revival TV series with Warwick Davis reprising his role. Um, so that'll be interesting coming up. But again, it, it's just like you look; he goes from Gun Ho to Willow. Like those are two completely different types of movies. Yes, there's some comedy in, in Willow, but it's not a comedy at all. Um, just a really cool fun fantasy flick. Wayne, what are your thoughts on Willow? I have not seen Willow in probably 30 years, so I don't really <laughs> recall it too much. Well, it, I believe it is on Disney Plus, so if anybody has Disney Plus, uh, take, take, go over to Disney Plus and watch Willow. I also have not seen it in a long time, but I used to watch it all the time as a kid. Um, so in, in, if you ask me, Wayne, and I, we're going to talk about two that you had mentioned prior, uh, this is where he was starting to hit real big. So you had Willow, and then you follow up one of my favorite comedies, Parenthood. And then you get the two for, uh, as, uh, from 91 to 92, the two that you two of the ones that you mentioned were Backdraft. Uh, we, the greatest fireman movie of all time. Not really, yes, but, you know. Andy Rohr. Um, <laughs> shots have been fired. Backdraft, it, it, again, it, you know, similar to some of these other movies, like, is it perfect? Yes. No, I'm just kidding. It's, it's <laughs> <not>. <laughs> um, but it's just, it, it's something I used to watch all the time as a kid. I still get that same feeling watching it. Yes. It's over exaggerated, obviously, uh, but it, it has a great cast. Go ahead. The Donald Sutherland. Burn it all. Let it all burn. It's like, yep. That just that little that little right there. Blip character. Little scene, well, whatever it was just so off set unsettling. Like, I think I, I implore everybody who, who thought it was cheesy back in the day or the first time they watched it. I think part of the, you know, and I'm realizing that with our friend Andy, like, I saw a lot of these movies when I was, like, a child. So, like, they mm -hmm. still hold that to me. And I know for a fact some of the movies that him and I talked about last week or uh, the last two episodes, 
he saw when he got older. So you definitely, when you see something at a certain age, you have a different feeling about it. I implore people to go back and watch Backdraft, not for the story or the, the action, for the performances. Okay, Billy Baldwin may not be the greatest, but you have Kurt Russell, Robert De Niro, as you mentioned, Donald Sutherland, John Glenn. Um, I know Scott, there's some Scott people, Glenn. Um, Huh? John Scott Glenn, Glenn is the astronaut. Scott Glenn. <laughs> Sorry. Scott Glenn, not the astronaut John Glenn. Um, it's just, it's such a great cast. And the fact that, you know, it's one of those movies that when you start watching it for like 20, 25 minutes, there's no Robert De Niro. Then he drops in and I'm like, I've, every time I think I'm like, oh yeah, Robert De Niro's in this movie. <laughs> it always like goes over my head for some reason. And his hair was like reddish for some reason, I think, if I'm recalling properly. It's like, yeah, I think so. Going they, on here? Yeah, they, they were making, he was a character. Um, Oh, is that but, because it was Chicago and you had the South Side I Irish? So, yeah, everyone, yeah, 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 yeah. Right, you know, everyone's going to have red, one person has to at least have red hair in a Ron Howard film. Uh, I think it's in his contract. Um, so, Backdraft is just one of those films. It, again, it, it kind of like Gun Ho. I didn't realize that most people hated it. And I was like, up until recently. Most, most people like, are no. wrong. Because <laughs> my wife doesn't like it either. I put it on when she's like, oh, you're watching this movie? I was like, what? what? But it's Chicago, and there's fires, and and Billy Baldwin, and Kurt Russell, and, and doing Lee. it on an ambulance. Yes, <laughs> or a fire truck, fire truck. Jennifer Jason Lee is in it. it. It's got it's just got a great solid cast. Um, I really enjoyed this movie, Wayne. I know you wanted to say something a little bit about it if you want to talk about it for a minute. My grandfather was a Chicago fireman, and uh, his firehouse is depicted in a couple of the scenes. So that's always just a little nugget for me. It's like, hey. So, I don't know. I just, yeah, is it campy and over over the top? Yeah, but, you know, still, it's got, you know, fire and guys with axes. And, I don't know, yeah. firing. <laughs> you know, an awesome Donald Sutherland scene, which I alluded to earlier. I mean, it's, yes. it's got a lot of peace. I don't get the hate. So. Yeah, I don't understand. We're not saying it's, like, one of the greatest movies of all time. We're just simply saying that we enjoyed this film, and we think other people should watch it, too. Uh, I will say, I started to watch the straight-to-DVD sequel that came out a few years ago and i turned it off about f- 15 minutes in it is terrible do not try <laughs> it's simply called i believe backdraft 2 it's awful uh billy baldwin does return to reprise his role but all right Wayne, so i'm gonna let you talk about the next one because you mentioned it far and away starring uh tom cruise and nicole kidman this is another one that's kind of like hit and miss with a lot of people um the accents, while well, Nicole Kidman is a little bit more believable because, you know, she's got the Australian thing kind of going on. So you expect to hear some form of uniqueness out of her mouth. Mm-hmm. Tom Cruise tries really hard, but I just because I've heard Tom Cruise speak, it just I don't know. It didn't work for me. But uh, a young man leaves Ireland with his landlord's daughter after some trouble with the father. They dream of owning land at the big giveaway in Oklahoma circa 1893 so apparently there's a big land grab where you had to like stake your claim and that land was yours for however that works um the man becomes a local barehand boxer and rides glory until he is beaten then his employers steal all the money the couple had and they must fight off starvation so this that and the other thing i'm not going to break down the whole movie for you because i want you to watch it (laughs) <laughs> uh, it's really, uh, it is kind of a roller coaster ride because, hey, they're doing well. Look at this. You know, he's getting his brains knocked out, but yeah, it's cool. Mm-hmm. And then obviously, you talk about he loses and some shit happens, and they are basically on the streets and foraging to survive, if you will. Um, uh, obviously, yes. uh, the husband and wife at the time, Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's also got Thomas Gibson, uh, Robert Prosky. Barbara Babcock, Sarah Cusack, which I wonder if in relation to John and Joan Cusack, maybe, I don't know. They have yeah. another sister. They have a sister, but I, I think it's Ann Cusack, I believe. So, um, I, this is another one I haven't seen in a very long time, but I do have, I have memories of Tom Crow standing there with the flag and the wind's yeah. blowing and everything, and he stakes his claim. That like, is what, when I think of Far and Away, well, and this is what comes to mind. You know, we yeah, on this podcast, we talk a lot about romance films. It's totally like a romance story, a drama. And it's a, it's an immigrant, immigrant story as well, which I think ah. is that important. Was my, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. 
it's an important <laughs> song, you know. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. Moving on, fast forward. Um, in this, you know, time, you know, it's important to have these stories too. I think. Um, I know this one's older, obviously, but it's a, it pairs well. Like if you're gonna watch Far and Away, you might as well watch Cinderella Man, which is another movie about a, a old a boxer from. This is uh, more from the uh, what pro, the Prohibition era. The um, yes. when everyone was poor. What's it called? The Prohibition, the Great Depression. Great Depression. Um, but it, it's very similar, except that one's a, an American story and this one is an immigrant story, but they're both directed by Ron Howard. So I think it kind of it they both kind of fit together. So uh, a good combo watch would be, I think, those two films. Um, uh, he did The Paper in 94, which is a movie I remember liking, but I haven't seen it in such a long time. <laughs> then back to back, he did two, probably probably two of my favorite ones that he had, that he'd done, or at least that I watched a shit ton back in the 90s. Apollo 13, and, you know, Tom Hanks, uh, um, Bill Paxton, Kevin Bacon, uh, uh, Lieutenant Dan, I'm drawing a blank on his name, Gary Sinise, uh, I believe Ed Harris, too, is also in it. It's such a great, great cast. It's still a great movie, man. I, I put this one on, one on every once in a while. Um, everybody's fantastic in it. Uh, he did a great job directing it. It just it looks really great. It's tense. Um, you know, obviously this is when Tom Hanks was hitting on every every movie that came out was basically a classic with Tom Hanks. Um, he did it was it Philadelphia, Forrest Gump, and Apollo thirteen were like three consecutive movies that he did. Uh, yep. So he was he was killing it. Uh, it's a great movie. Um, it's one if you haven't seen it in a while, I definitely recommend watching it again. They've been they keep putting out like newer, better versions of it, and it's just a, it's a great fucking movie. Um, the other one is Ransom. And I know we yes. don't talk about this person as much, Mel Gibson, because of who he's kind of a piece of shit. However, uh, at this podcast, we separate people and their pieces of shit. The movie Ransom is fantastic. And it, it's a, so it's a story of Mel Gibson is a celebrity. His child gets taken for Ransom, obviously. Uh, Gary Sinise is in it. He's one of uh, the... Um, I guess I kind of already spoiled it, but it's got a, it's got a great... Uh, supporting cast because you got Lee F. Schreiber who was just kind of coming onto the scene. One of his well. first movies that I, I recall him in. Or yeah, that and like Phantoms. I think it was that and Phantoms were like the first two that he the, the mainstream mm-hmm. movies. Um, with Gary Sinise, as I mentioned, Rene Russo plays the wife. Don't forget uh, Donnie Wahlberg. Yep, D- Donnie Wahlberg, Delroy Lindo, Lily Taylor, um, Evan Handler from uh, Sex in the City. Uh, Michael and Californication. Yeah, and Californication. Uh, Paul Guilfoyle. So a lot of great character actors who Jose Zaniga. Uh, just uh, Dan Hedaya was in it too, and John Ortiz. So like almost everybody in that movie is recognizable. I've always really liked Ransom. Uh, I've watched it a ton of times. I saw it in the theaters when it came out. Such a great, uh, just entertaining thriller. Um, lots of fun. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on Ransom, Wayne? Just... The ballsiness of it, you know what I mean? Like, obviously, for the situation being what it is, you know, and just challenging, you know, the kidnappers, if you will. It's like, yeah, oh, the, what the fuck? And you also <laughs> kind of have to wonder, like, does if you're the kid, does my father actually love me? <laughs> right, exactly, yeah. It, there's so many tense moments in it with the, you know, is he giving him the money? Is he not giving him the money? Delroy Lindo is the, is the lead cop in it. It does have a twist in it that you don't see coming right away, um, but it's just it's really really good. I recommend people watch that if they haven't seen it. Um, Ed TV, how to uh, again? This is right after Ransom. He did Ed TV, which is a strange comedy with Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrelson. Um, watch it if you want. I don't really remember too much of it except it's kind of like, a re- huh? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, Sorry. it's kind of like a reality show, right? I mean, it's yeah. like you know. That, that was kind of the, the the beginning of that idea or what like what if we had TVs in someone's house and that and now we now everyone has a fucking TV in their house that they can record on and stream out to the world so um, I would be interested to see how it holds up today I have I've only watched it like once or twice back when it came out uh, the Grinch now the Grinch is definitely another movie that's very critically not liked and I think I when it came out I remember audience what like I loved it because I'm a Jim Carrey fan but not being a bit, very big crowd pleaser. However, it has now become like a Christmas classic and everyone plays it around Christmas. Um, so, uh, you know, some movies stand the test of time that we don't think will. And th- this one did. What, what are your thoughts? You got, 
you've got the people that are set in their ways. Well, I like Boris Karloff, and you know, it's for me, it's, it's always going to be the cartoon, and we can't ever change that because for me, that's what I feel comfortable with. It's like you know what, fine. Yeah, they, they turned a twenty-minute cartoon into an hour and hour hour and a half long movie. So yes, yeah. they had to add stuff. You've got Jim Carrey over the top. So, but again, a fantastic job, especially you know, when he talks about you know having to get all the makeup and all the the costume on mm-hmm. and what he had to go through. And yeah, I just you know the who the who's in Whoville have more personality, and you there have more depth. Sure, they're yeah, not right. just little filler pieces so mm-hmm. I, again lots i don't get yeah. yeah i don't i don't get the hate so yeah lots of great performances from that movie too uh everyone was kind of <laughs> doing a really good job there um and then we get to where you know it was kind of like for three in a row almost he, even a little more than that he was uh i mean da vinci codes in there but you like he- heavy awards style movies you got a beautiful mind which won a bunch of oscars uh, maybe not a bunch, but it won a couple Oscars as um, what's her name? Uh, Jennifer Connelly won. I think that might be the year that Ron Howard actually won for best uh, director as well. Um, Beautiful Mind. Yeah. Was that yes. the year? He went, he won for uh, winners were best picture, best actress, Jennifer Connelly, best director and best screenplay. Yeah. So that one, that was his a big awards winner. Um, and d- well deserved, uh, incredible yeah. film, great performance from Russell Crowe. The only reason Russell Crowe didn't win is because he won the year before for Gladiator. So I mean, they they kind of effed that up. But uh, um, as they did, you know, he should have won the year before Gladiator for The Insider. So um, it, it's crazy that you have not that it, not that Gladiator is a bad movie. I love Gladiator, but it wasn't to of me. The it wasn't three you listed, life. it's the least impactful role I, in my I, opinion. Yes, exactly. That's a good. That's a really good way to put it. Away. Um, so he followed that up with the missing, which is a really good, like Western thriller. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was, um, was that was it Blanchett, right? Kate Blanchett, Tommy Lee Jones. Um, really great, great story. Great movie. Looks amazing. Evan Rachel Wood is also in it too. Aaron Eckhart, Val Kilmer. That's another one I've been wanting to watch again lately. Cause it, it's really, really good. Uh, we talked at length about Cinderella Man. I think at least once, if not twice, by now. So um, I've mentioned it more than once. Another yes. Russell Crowe. Uh, we are, we mentioned it earlier on this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> we literally talked about it about five minutes ago. Um, uh, a great redemption story. We'll leave it at that because we don't want you guys to get bored with this. So, all right, Wayne, I'll let you start off with the next one: uh, the Da Vinci Code. Go into oh that. Oh my one. gosh, the most polarizing film I think we have on here. Uh, because of the content, um, let me break this movie down for you guys. It's 2006. Um, it's based off the novel by Dan Brown, screenplay done by Akiva Goldsman, <clears throat> starring Tom Hanks, Audrey Tatu, Tautu? Tatu, yep. Jean Reno, Ian McKellen. Uh, Paul Beatty, Alfred Molina, Jurgen Pronchov. Uh, I don't know if there's anybody else here that would really know. Okay, so Dan Brown's controversial best-selling novel about a powerful secret that's been kept under wraps for thousands of years comes to the big screen in the thriller directed by Ron Howard. Okay, basically, this is a description of the, the, the novel. So basically... This movie is about Jesus' secret life and his marriage to Mary Magdalene and his subsequent child. And, of course, the the evangelicals freaked out because, oh, my gosh, they're trying to besmirch besmirch the name of Jesus and it takes away from his divinity and this, that, and the other thing. And there were protests for this movie. Like, um... I am, feel very strongly in regards to because for a long time I was anti this movie. I don't want to watch this. How dare they, you know, besmirch, you know, you know, this and religion and blah, 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 without actually, you know, doing any research or anything in regards to that. I was just parroting what I was told in mm-hmm. places. And, you know, it's, it's, it's art, first and foremost. It's... Um, this is a movie to entertain. I guess Dan Brown's novel kind of 
is semi, you know, investigative, investigatory or investigative in regards to this oh, yeah. could be the case and blah, 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 blah. It's like, okay, you know what, guys, let's just calm it all down. Like, I just remember being really against seeing this. And when I finally actually watched it, it's an amazing movie. Like, absolutely fantastic job. Uh, thriller with a good bit of action sprinkled in there. Um, I'm not going to touch too much more on the religious aspects of it because let's just talk about a fantastic piece of cinema. Uh, it's oh, how long is this thing? Like two it's and at least hours. two and a half hours long, I think. And it, it's one of these that does not feel because it is such a roller coaster ride of stuff going down and chases and you know thrillers that you're trying to figure mm-hmm. out what's going on here. Mystery. Yeah. Sorry, I kind of went off on a tangent there just no, because. It's, it's all right, man. It, you know, it's definitely one of those things similar to like Harry Potter that took a lot of criticism when it came out just because from the, the kind of people you're talking about because of what they thought it meant and understood. The You know, the thing with the Da Vinci Code, Angels and Demons and whatever the other ones are called, uh, they're page turners. You know, they're, yes. they're books that you buy at the airport and you could honestly finish them. I never read Da Vinci Code, but I read Angels and Demons and I liked it enough. But I was literally done with it in like a day and a half because it's one of those things where you're like, oh, my God, I got to, you know, it's not necessarily yep. written well, but it's like I got to know what happened. And you, and the movies play out very similarly. Um, I haven't seen Da Vinci Code in a long time. I saw it in theaters. I remember liking it enough. I didn't, you know, I wasn't in love with it or anything, but I, I enjoyed mm-hmm. it. Uh, Tom Hanks, I thought, did a good job. It, you know, these movies are funny because then you do get a lot of people, too, that like, oh, God, I'm going to sound like such a pretentious douchebag when i say it like this but like people that didn't read books read this book if that makes sense you know what i mean and it was like everybody like literally everybody was like hey did you read the da vinci code and you're like you you look at that person like you've never talked to me about a book a day in your life like what what so it had that crossover effect that um just you know when you think popcorn action film this was a popcorn novel and then, like I said, they're called page turners. You know, it was something that people couldn't put down. Very interesting. The mysteries were very interesting. I think when you base something in religion, if you, someone that's open minded can read that and be like, oh, well, I could see this playing out like this or something like that. Go ahead, Wayne. This was my first real foyer where I really realized that, you know, as a person who had, you know, went to church for a long time and has kind of really kind of taken a step back to, look at the grander scheme of things. This is the first time I noticed like the church kind of commanding people not to go see this and to protest against it. It's like, I can go into this whole deal about how, you know, if the church wants to have this, the stance then maybe they should start paying some taxes. Yeah. We won't go there. We're not. It's just, this is the first time I realized that manipulation exists. Well, yeah and like each movie has a like a bad priest in it too. So there, there, you know, there are those things too that I'm sure they didn't like. And, um, but no, it's a, the first two, at least I haven't seen, was it lost symbol or intruder or whatever? I, I didn't know. I don't know anybody that's seen that one, but it's the third one that they did. Inferno. I, maybe? Inferno. That that's, yeah. Inferno. Um, but yeah, angels and demons and Da Vinci code. I enjoy enough to where like, if they're on, I won't turn them off or anything. Um, but sandwiched in between there is one of my favorite movies that he did. Um, and it, it, it's not rushed this time. Uh, we talked about that movie. Uh, Frost Great Nixon. Man. Yeah, <laughs> we've talked about it a lot. Frost Nixon. Uh, Frost Nixon is is interesting to me. It's a, it's a political drama about the time that Frost interviewed Nixon. Mm-hmm. And it's it's historically based on this thing that actually happened um, when Nixon was, uh, right, I think it was right after Whitewater. Uh, was it, was it called Watergate. Whitewater. Watergate, Whitewater. Whitewater <laughs> right was the Clinton Whitewater. scandal. Yeah. Right after they went whitewater rafting. Um, well, well, how about a time when you actually held a person accountable, regardless of your political side? Right, exactly. It was, yeah, it was an interview that he was encouraged not to do, but he wanted to kind of prove that he still had a hold on the truth in his own mind, which was not really the truth. Um, great performances in this one. I, it's a movie that it was nominated for Best Picture. I don't think it really won anything. Um, I remember it being a very like small year. It was the year that Benjamin Button was up and um, uh, Frank Langella as Nixon, Michael Sheen uh, as Frost. And then you have Kevin Bacon, Sam Rockwell, Matthew McFadden, Oliver Platt, Rebecca Hall, Toby Jones. Uh, that's pretty much it for the main cast. So just a huge cast. 
uh, written by Peter Morgan, who did the Queen movie and a bunch of other like big British films because David Frost is a British uh, journalist. Um, and it was like he was doing it to be taken seriously. And, you know, they thought it was going to be like this fluff piece, but they really end up getting to like the nitty gritty of what was going on. Really just a really good, intense film and for a small movie, too. It basically takes place in a room in a house and that's it that's like almost the entire movie obviously they show them preparing outside of the house they have to cut the interview a bunch of times so they have a bunch of them in separate rooms like talking to each other how's it going what's going on just a really incredible film did not make a lot of the box office i remember the story of 2009 milk was the i think the one that won or uh, at least sean penn won and like Benjamin Button was the only movie that made over a hundred million dollars that year at best for best picture so it was it was a very small year um, and I really, really, really love Frost Nixon. Such a fantastic film. Was that around the writer's strike? It might time? have been. It might have been around that. We've had so many. But it, yeah, it might have been around that time. It was 2008. Was the, it was 2009 Oscars. Okay. Because 2007, 2007 is, I think, when they went on strike and there was a big backlog of... That might have been, yeah. It's I'm very trying to figure out why it was such a light year. Yeah, it could have been a very slow year that year. Um, actually, you know what? I think, I think, was that the slum dog year? That might've been the slum dog year. Um, which yeah, that movie was really good too, but what does um, a slum dog know anyway? Yes. <laughs> uh, it's a good movie. Um, all right. So that again, so then he follows that up frost, Nixon and angels and demons with the dilemma, a Vince Vaughn, Kevin James comedy. So that's what I'm talking about. Like Ron Howard's career is just like all over the fucking place. Like it's just, I don't know. I don't know if it's some of these that they were producing or, or what, and they just he decided to take on. Um, In the Heart of the Sea was 2015. I actually really liked that movie. That's another one that wasn't very well received. Um, all right, Wayne. Here, well, we've made it to the one that I think that you should talk about because uh, you love it. Uh, Solo, a Star Wars story. Stepped in for uh, Miller, uh, Lord and Miller, who who were basically I don't know fired as the way, but asked to leave the picture. Uh, so the movie was already partially shot, but Ron Howard stepped in to finish. The main change he made was uh, getting rid of Michael K. Williams and putting in Paul Bettany as the as the lead villain. Um, so, uh, Wayne, what are your thoughts on Solo, a Star Wars story? Uh, another one where I do not understand the hate. This was a really nice, really nice movie. Uh, a lot of people had a problem with Alden Enrehart, Enric. I can never say the, the actor's name. I apologize. Th- that's OK. Yeah, me either. Aaron, Aaron Rick or something like that. Yeah. Aaron Rick. Okay. You know, and they had a problem with, you know, Harrison Ford not being Han Solo. Granted for when this was, you know, the young Han Solo film or an origin story, you can't really have a 70 year old Harrison Ford, Mm -hmm. at least at the time, portraying it. I think he did a fantastic job with the mannerisms and I thought he was believable. It took me about two minutes to, you know, get over it and, you know, uh, you know, Woody Harrelson as Beckett, uh, Donald Glover as a young Lando Calrissian. A, ma- a great job. Like, really believable. Had a lot of Billy D. Williams mannerisms and stuff into it with delivery and whatnot. Uh, obviously, we saw how uh, Han met Chewie. And I thought, I, I, I don't have anything. I don't have any problems with this. I want a sequel just because... The reveal at the end, you know, Darth Maul is still alive. All right, let's do this. Let's see where this goes. And it's been panned so much that I don't think we're ever going to get it. But no, yeah. The only thing I think that make they've announced, I thought they announced it, but it hasn't been any movement on it since the announcement was that Donald Glover would be playing Lando in some sort of Disney Plus series, which I think is probably still going to happen. He's very, he's always very busy, so a lot of times when he agrees to do to a pro, uh, do a project, it's usually uh, when I'm available, we'll do this. So, right. um, and then uh, yeah, obviously this is I, I think John Favreau's first venture into the Star Wars universe. So. He was the robot, right? Uh, he played. He voiced Rio Durant. I don't remember which character that is, but um, I think it was the robot that had like a like a personality. If I remember, that was uh, Phoebe Waller Bridge L three thirty seven. She oh, actually was, okay. incorporated into the Millennium Falcon, which is okay. why. Okay, I'm going to nerd out here for a little bit, which is why C three PO says your your ship has the most interesting dialect. It's actually a sassy L three thirty seven, not wanting to nice. cooperate. So. Very nice. 
And I'll de-nerd and we'll go back. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I've only seen that movie once, so I can't really comment much. I remember liking it. I didn't love it, um, but I did like it. I thought I enjoyed it enough. I did not think Alden Ehrenreich was an issue. Uh, it really bothers me that Kathleen Kennedy, you know, oh, well, obviously we can't, you know, recast these actors. Well, you know what? People are going to fucking die. People are going to get too old. You're going to have to recast at some point if you want to continue to use these characters. And Or you just shit all over them and kill them off in the worst possible fucking way. Right, exactly. Or, yeah, treat, them, treat them shitty anyway. So, it, you know, it's just, and that's a good point. They have, you know don't care enough to like treat all the characters with a lot of love. Now, obviously um, uh, Princess Leia, the actress uh, passing away, obviously had a lot. I'm Carrie sure Fisher. changed a lot. Yeah. Um, Carrie Fisher. That's right. I'm trying to blank on names today. Changed the way that role ended up being. And um, the whole Luke thing was weird. You know, Luke I, would not go hide on an Island. <laughs> the whole Han Solo thing. Um, I didn't have a problem with that as much, especially because I know that was Harrison Ford going, I'll do this movie, but I got to die. And so you knew that at some point he was going to die during Force Awakens. I can't, and I'm sorry, I'm going to, I, I'm going to contain myself, but the best part of that was when Han and Leia had scenes together. Just yes. the one, I think. Yeah, and, basically. Yeah. The, sending him off on their way and then never seeing him again. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was weird. I really liked that one. And I like, and I like, so we've talked before. I, I, I liked Last Jedi, so I'm different, but, um, it, you know, and I get fans not being happy with, with how it turned out, um, and maybe we'll revisit. But, again, if you're going to do a young Luke Skywalker show, they have to recast him. And we've already said Sebastian Stan would be the perfect guy to do that. Um, he looks Mark very... Campbell's already given his blessing to it, too. It's like. So it's stop stop CGIing 65-year-old Mark Hamill to look like he's 30-year-old Mark Hamill. It just bothers me. Um, all right. So uh, we're, we're going to move on to our reviews. Of the week. And this week we had um, two Netflix films. We're going to start off with the more action-centered uh, film. And then we had a, a children's film or a family film, whatever you want to call it. Um, the first one is one of those action comedies. And it went through some changes as it was being made. Originally, it was supposed to be uh, Kevin Hart and... Um, uh, Jason Statham, and then it was uh, given to uh, he was replaced with Woody Harrelson, and it, okay, let me let me get through the plot here. <laughs> um, Teddy Hart, Teddy, played by Kevin Hart, is a failed internet athletic instructor attempting to sell his idea of non-contact boxing to local gym owner Marty Roach or Marty, uh, played by Roach. Oh, that was weird. Uh, but Marty rejects the idea on the basis that it's nonsensical and Teddy's and Teddy's failure to do something as simple as design a marketing brochure proves he's incompetent. So you have this down on your luck, regular guy whose wife is the breadwinner and he's trying to make his life, you know, his wife's life better and his life better and got all these inventions and ideas and stuff going through his head. He sets up a, a, anniversary or a birthday trip for his wife and they are yep. going to go to a cabin and the printer has no toner which becomes a joke throughout the movie uh low toner so you get, he gets the address wrong which i think we've all you know had printed shit with low toner and we, we when's get the that. last time you printed something and not just kept it on your phone though that's a very that's a very good point actually that, that's, that's actually what took really me good. out of it like it's like you got it right there on your phone <laughs> Just and, and it's funny because it could definitely take you out of it because they go back to that joke like eight times. Yeah. Um, and so he ends up going to the wrong house. They think he's this assassin called the man from Toronto. And he ends up getting the information they need. And right when he, he's about the, the guy who gave the information is about to get killed, the cops come in, the FBI comes in, and they arrest Kevin Hart's character. And they quickly realize that he is not actually the man from Toronto and that it was a mistake. So it's not one of those like mistaken identity things that that the authorities don't know about for a long time. They figure it out pretty quickly just by talking to him that he's not an assassin. Um, and then uh, Woody Harrelson's character that he shows up late, but he sees everything that's going on, and so he basically uses uh, Teddy to uh, infiltrate the bad guys that he needs to question these other guys they've kidnapped, and um, so he kind of uses him to his advantage. 
you know, it's revealed throughout the movie that he, slowly that he, uh, the man from Toronto, is not really happy being an assassin anymore. So that's kind of play, at play here. Um, Kelly Cuoco's in it as well. Uh, Ellen Barkin plays uh, the the voice on the phone. Um, the handler, if you will. The handler, which I thought it was odd too, Wayne, that he had handler written on his cell phone. I was like, mm-hmm. if anyone like picks this up, they're going <laughs> to, like, I don't know. I, that was, I figured it would be more covert, which I was like, but I, you know, if I was like undercover FBI, would I have a number on my phone that just said FBI? <laughs> like, probably not. Um, so there were things in this movie that didn't make a lot of sense. I, I honestly, for the first, it's a lot, it's not that it's long, but it's almost two hours when it probably could have been an hour and a half. Yes. Um, I didn't really enjoy it that much, Wayne. What are, What are your thoughts? I was honestly, I was done after the uh, the puke scene. I'm like, okay. That's oh cool. yeah, yeah. I forgot about that. It's yeah, like, you know, it's it's got some okay jokes at times. It's all right. The problem is, we all know this style of movie. It's the hitman's bodyguard. It's the spy who dumped me. It's a uh, spy with Melissa McCarthy, which is a great one if you haven't seen i've I've talked about that movie many times that's the that's the top and like man from toronto's towards the bottom unfor- unfortunately too much it. kevin hart he's too kevin hardy too he's you know, too over the top it's like tone it down just a little bit maybe we have something but i just think the and the jokes weren't landing i think that was a huge part of it i do credit them the last action sequence that they have at the end of the movie i thought was done really well lots yeah. of like fast zooms lots of you could tell they had like a camera spinning around the room, which I thought was really cool. So I do give them credit for that. They pulled one really badass action sequence. Of course, the other part of it too is, and not that Jason Statham doesn't have stunt people, but Jason Statham actually knows all those karate things that this character is supposed to know. So I think not, and I love, we love Woody Harrelson on this podcast. Don't you think otherwise? Cause we, we are huge fans of his. I just don't know that he was the right replacement. I feel like they were like, well, he's bald. It'll work. Like, he's a bald white guy, sure. <laughs> like they're like almost twenty years apart in age. For one, yeah. two, Statham actually again he knows like karate. He used to compete in that shit. You so, can almost tell when it's not Woody Harrelson, yes. like easily. So yeah, it was a weird recast. Um, and I love Woody Harrelson. I'm sure they cast him because of his comic wit. And the fact that he can pull off a lot of that, you know, anger and all that stuff. Um, but it just didn't work. It didn't work for this movie. I, You know, I was going to say like a 5 out of 10, but now after talking about it a little more, maybe like a 4 out of 10. Like, it, it's not great. It, the, and I just noticed the reviews weren't great either. Um, but, yeah, I did not really uh, enjoy it. So, Wayne, what, what are your final thoughts and rating? I was at like a 3.5 or 4. It's not something I'm going to ever put on again, even as background noise. I mean, I may not switch off it. If yeah. it comes on the TV, but I stream everything, so it's never going to be on my TV. <laughs> Unless like Dawson in like five years like starts watching it or something, and you're like, oh, all right, this movie again. Um, and you know who knows? Maybe sometime, maybe this movie will have a different life because sometimes these comedies don't hit hard when they come out, and then after years, people watch them and they're like, oh, it's actually really good. I don't I'm think happy I didn't pay to see this in the theater. How about that? Yes, this is very true. All right, so the next one we have um, is the newest movie this week that came out, and it is the Netflix 2022 film The Sea Beast, animated film directed by Chris Williams of Over the Hedge, um, starring Carl Urban, Zaris Angel Hotter, Jared Harris, Marion Jean Baptiste. It is. <laughs> oh, go ahead, play it. You knew what I was, what word I was expecting to hear when I heard uh, Carl Urban's voice, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> not in this movie. <laughs> I hope not in this movie. <laughs> oh. that, that, Sorry. That sea is the right cunt. <laughs> Did not come out of his mouth. Yeah. Look at all your cunts on this ship. <laughs> um. Yeah. It's a very yeah. Inter- interesting choice. You know, I like Carl Urban, so I, I, I was good with that. But yeah, you're right. Yeah. The, you, what, especially in the middle of the season of the boys right now, you're what you know, it's fresh in your head. Um, it you know, this movie is about a little kid who kind of reads the history books of these beasts that exist, and she wants to be a, a hunter. And the hunters are the ones that go out and t- 
take the beast down, kill the beast, really. I mean, they show them killing him. Like, I was kind of like, I was like, whoa, this is getting kind of, there's no blood or anything, but I'm like, this is getting kind of violent. We're like cutting this beast into pieces. Um, so we get to see them fight these beasts early on uh, when, after we meet the, the main character, the kid. And then we go and we meet our other main character, Carl Urban, who uh, Jacob, who is um, poised to take over the cap as being captain of the ship when his captain, uh, played by uh, Jared Harris, eventually retires. And, you know, he's all into it, getting these monsters. Well, as we speed through this, there comes a point where the little girl ends up on their ship, stowing away on their ship. And her and Carl Urban's Jacob get um, taken by the big sea beast, the blaster, the red blaster. And that's what they're sent to kill. And so they have to... Like, <laughs> I thought it was the red bastard. I was like... <laughs> <laughs> so you thought the red bastard was the right cunt. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> makes sense um you know it it uh it was good i you know, i enjoyed this movie it was a fun kids movie it's not like you know when i watch these kid movies these days i i, I want to feel like i did like watching turning red or uh the mitchells versus the machines like emotional i didn't feel emotional throughout this movie really for the characters but i did enjoy it as a, as a pirate uh mm-hmm. sea monster film uh it did a good job, I think. Um, it was a nice mix of Pirates of the Caribbean, Pokemon, and uh, what was the third one? There was something else. Uh, how to Train Your Dragons. It really. Thank you. That's exactly what I was thinking. It's basically yep. How to Train Your Dragons, but in the water. That's essentially right. what it is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, with pirates. Yeah, it's it's a good movie. It, I really I I liked it. I think kids will like it. Um, I, other thing I wanted to point out too with. There's so many in this time of this pandemic, which we've, we've been in forever. There's so many fucking kid movies that have been put to streaming. This is just another one that's really good that you, if you got kids, there's so many movies to watch through Netflix, Disney Plus, Hulu, um, uh, Prime, I think even has a couple, uh, Peacock, stuff like that. So it just the content is there uh, and they're making pretty good ones. So I, I would definitely recommend this one. Uh, yeah, Wayne, the animation is really nice too. It's like, you know, it's, it's sharp and it's, it keeps your attention it does you know that's the one thing i worry about watching these animation movies and streaming i'm concerned sometimes that they're going to appear like those straight to dvd animated films which look really awful but yeah. they do spend a lot of money on these and and i think it really uh it looked really good i would give it um a seven and a half out of ten i would say it, you know it like i said it didn't hit me emotionally but it did it did entertain me for for the almost two hour runtime again Another movie, just like Man from Toronto, could have benefited from probably 30 less minutes or 20 less minutes, but still very entertaining. I didn't mind finishing this one when with Man from Toronto, I'm like, all right, let's, let's wrap this up here. Fuck, it's, it's over. Fuck. Thank God. <laughs> so what's your final uh, rating? I'll give it a seven. You yeah. know, yeah. not something I will seek out again, but if I have the nieces and nephews around or... Yeah, I would well, definitely watch it. I'd be happy to sit through if I have my phone to kind of get through yeah. and occupy the children. <laughs> agreed, agreed. It's, it's a solid flick for sure. Um, all right, so we'll talk a little bit about some of the movies I've watched in the last couple of weeks, and then we'll get into the news and notes, which is very long. So I'm not going to, I'm just going to mention the ones I've seen. I'm not really going to get into We've had a rough week with folks and losing people. So Yes, yes, we did. So we'll, we'll definitely get to that. Um, so while my family left early for vacation, I decided to get into the weird stuff. I watched, uh, the Northman. Um, uh, okay. Top Gun Maverick, I guess isn't weird, but, uh, Northman. These are all movies I recommend too, by the way. Uh, the, um, unbearable something of massive talent with Nick Cage. Great. Unbearable weight of massive talent. Really awesome. The black phone. Really awesome. Hondo, I'll get into my old movie, People Watching. Again, I've been very busy over the last two weeks, so I've missed these last two weeks, but I will watch a couple more John Wayne movies this week. Uh, Andy and I, uh, we we really talked about, I don't know, if, I can't remember if we talked on the podcast or not, but uh, uh, Crimes of the Future, uh, a very bizarre, very weird David Cronenberg film. <laughs> for, for us normal folks, you can go ahead and pass on that one. <laughs> for us non-normal folks, it's amazing. Uh, everything, everywhere, all at once, uh, which I really, really enjoyed. 
Um, also watched, I did watch Uncharted Wayne, which we had, you had watched previously. Donovan and I really liked that one. Um, I do love how it sets up the, for the, the next one too, at the end. Um, yeah, so that's that's basically what I've watched in the last couple of weeks, Wayne. What? Or, oh, also Stranger Things, uh, season four. Yeah. Uh, fucking, I mean, there are things I. This is the one season where there were a couple things I didn't like about it, but overall, mm-hmm. I still loved it. Um, I I've seen a couple of people say, "Man, this Hopper stuff could have really been toned down." I agree, uh, and I love Hopper. He's probably one of my favorite characters. But the whole Russian thing going like that took up a lot of time. Um, I would have appreciated that a little less. However, I still love this. Yeah. Pseudo spoiler. I actually thought Hopper was going to be killed They're just because of the, yeah. the amount of time they spent on him. And so, okay, cool. And I like Hopper. I like his character. Um, yeah, for sure. You know, it was definitely the most metal uh, it, season. It was. They dive, I, They definitely dive into 80s metal for sure. I still liked season three better. Same. But, you know. Well, see, and we're in the minority because most people hate season three. So, you know, well, I think you mean their least favorite. favorite. Yeah, you, me, and Andy, I think, because Andy and I had talked about this previously too, where we felt that season three was actually really fucking strong. For me, this is the first time that I didn't like the new season more than the other seasons previously. Yeah, I like like it always. Like I love season one, and then season two came out. Like, oh my god, this is amazing. Then season three, I was like, oh my god, this is amazing the most memorable characters were not the original staff in season three or season four, I should say. It, that you was, know, it was a lot in, or, or it was an elephant, like, um, uh, uh, Max, Max was a, a, she's a main character, but she was kind of minor in two and three. She yeah. gets elevated big time in this season. Um, and she did fantastic. It was amazing. I yeah, love that. Yeah. But you know, Lewis and Mike and Will, they're just kind of, they're the really the side characters, the supporting characters in this. Well, and especially because they separated them so long. Like I didn't, that's the other thing I didn't like is I didn't like the fact that our four main characters or five, if you include L were not together for the majority of the movie or the that series. That was my problem with season two. So. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. Uh, that's why uh, right. I know. the stranger things podcast. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the pizza delivery guy with the long hair was amazing. So Obviously good. Eddie Everything Munson was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Any anything that he's the pizza guy has been in, he's he's always really funny. Yeah. Um. All right, Wayne. Anything that you watch? I know you. Uh, I was proud that you went and watched a couple of the movies that Andy and I were talking about that were weird and strange. So give me give me some of your thoughts. Um. Yeah. Your uh, future crimes was a little bit. What the f- is going on? Um. You know, like I had trouble following it because it's kind of weirded out. But yes. you know, whatever. Um. <laughs> everything. Everything, everything everywhere, everywhere. All at once. yeah. That was a hard one for me to like follow. What the hell's going on here? But it was funny, and it had cool action and like the weird like. I don't know how to relate it to something else that I've seen, but it's very, it's funny action, like with yeah. the fighting in the FBI or the attack like, of the uh, IRS building and whatnot. Uh, so, what's the one? Uh, Kung Fu Hustle. Yes, that's it's similar. It. I think that's a good comparison, not story wise, but action wise. It uses a lot of that kind of action comedy. Well, anyway, and then at the end, when you figure out when everything, why everything is happening, it's like, oh, hmm, okay, I get it. I yeah. so for me, the last like thirty minutes, I was like weeping. I was like, I'm like, what is going on with me right now? I was very emotional. Yeah, uh, but yeah, that was one of my favorite movies that I've seen in a while. Um, was I, was I vague think? enough there? I don't want to give anything away. No, no, you, no. Yeah, you were. Yeah, you were. What did you think of the Northman? I know you started. Did you finish that one? <laughs> no, I did not. Okay. The whole barking like dogs and pretending we're dogs thing right at the beginning. I'm like, yeah, I'm done. I'm good. Oh, so good. Uh, was that was my buddy had a good comparison. He's like, the problem with the Northman is they 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 positioned it as this huge Viking action film. And really, the majority of the action is in the beginning and the end. In the middle, after the dog barking stuff, is a lot of the character kind of um, hatching his plan of revenge. So it's very like kind of a slow burn for a while. But I really, really liked it a lot. And like the music, turn into werewolves. Cool. Yes, turn into werewolves. <laughs> oh. that would have been interesting. Or vampires, since he was a vampire on True Blood. Um, but yeah, okay. So anything else that you watched that wasn't those weird movies that I know you were you were trying to keep up on with us? <laughs> I found uh, that '70s show, so I've been going through that, finishing that up. You found it? Well, I found a like I got it the DVD series. 
Oh, nice. Okay. Okay. I was like, I'm like I've seen that. when we started this podcast, it was right in the middle of watching it when Netflix just like, no more. I'm yeah. like, hey. Yeah. So, you so fin- yeah. you're about to finish it? Yes. Nice. Uh, and I, yeah, yeah, the last season. <laughs> yeah, I heard it well because he was gone and they brought in uh, Seth Meyers' brother uh, yeah. to who was supposed to originally replace Eric, but they just created a new character. Um, I was just reading about that. All right. So uh, we're going to wrap this up with the news and notes, everybody. Yep. I also started watching uh, the Sopranos again, or at least the first couple episodes, just because of the loss that we've all suffered. Yes. Yes. Let me, let me get through the, the news and the movies and then we'll talk about, because we had, like you said, we had a couple deaths this, this past week. Um, well, with the last couple weeks, because we've been we've been haven't recorded in a couple weeks. All right. So news this week: Millie Bobby Brown in talks for a Star Wars role. Sebastian Stan starring in psychological thriller for A twenty four films. It is called A Different Man. Yellowstone spinoff with Harrison Ford and Helen Mirren will now be called Nineteen Twenty three and take place during Prohibition. Zoe Kazan, following in her grandfather's footsteps, will do a mini series of John Steinbeck's East of Eden which her grandfather directed the film over 70 years ago. Florence Pugh will star in the miniseries for Netflix. Maze Runner director Wes Ball stepping down from Harbinger adaptation to focus on directing New Planet of the Apes movie. Leah Sado joins Dune Part 2 as Lady Margot. Nia Vidalis returning to direct and star in My Big Fat Greek Wedding 3. Aldous and Edwin Hodge will write and star in Sci-Fi Parallel, which is a remake of a Chinese film Parallel Forest from 2019 directed by Li Zhang. Karash Ahari, The Yellow Paper, and The Night will direct the remake, and Daniel Deadweiler will star alongside the Hodge brothers. Kelsey Boulding will direct Breeders, starring Olivia Cook and produced by Adam McKay. Lionsgate has acquired the film. Horror graphic novel Hotel being adapted into film with Ellie Callahan and Anthony Ruff writing the screenplay, which Callahan will direct. Bloomhouse turning Paula Hawkins' new movie Blind Spot into streaming movie. No word on where it will stream. Uh, rumor Jedi Fallen Order star Cameron Monaghan will reply his role of Cal Kestis in future Star Wars live action series. If you have played that film or you know anything about it, that is very exciting news. Yeah, that game. Yeah, I know. I've heard about the game, so that's that's really cool. I'm sorry, I, I said film. It, it'll be something fun. Sorry. <laughs> Gina Rodriguez, Zachary Levi, Every Carganella, and Connor Esterson will lead Spy Kids reboot for Netflix, directed by Robert Rodriguez. Henry Zierney reteams with Ready or Not directors for Scream 6. Lee Wanell negotiating to direct new Green Hornet film. Paul Giamatti joins HBO Max 30 Coins Season 2. Selling Sunset has been renewed for Season 6 and 7 over at Netflix. Michael Rooker reteaming with John McNaughton, director of Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, for new killer film called Road Rage. Alyssa Jurls, Toby Huss, Reno Wilson, and Brian Goodman join Fatal Attraction series at Paramount+. Plus. Dark Winds on AMC already in production on Season 2. The Duffer Brothers are working on Stranger Things spinoff. Alice Eve, Shelley Hennig, and Antonio Banderas will star in the thriller The Last Girl. Russell Crowe playing real-life priest in The Pope's Exorcist. Kristen Stewart's Love Lies Bleeding from director Rose Glass, who directed St. Maud has added Dave Franco, Ed Harris, Katie O'Brien, Jenna Malone, and Anna Barashiknagov. A24 released the film. Emma Roberts, latest to join Madam Webb at Sony Marvel. Izzy, Michael Small, and Joey Phillips join Outlander Season 7 as Rachel and Denzel Hunter. Professional boxer Callie Reese joins Jodie Foster in True Detective Season 4. Don Lee's The Gangster, The Cop, The Devil, officially being remade at Paramount. Lee will star in this one too, and he will produce. The Russo Brothers, The Electric State, starring Millie Bobby Brown, is landed at Netflix. Lachlan Wilson joins Chucky Season 2 as Glenn slash Glenda, a character originally seen in Seed of Chucky. Cameron Diaz comes out of retirement, this is big news, to star in Back in Action with Jamie Foxx at Netflix. Kate Winslet will star in and produce Trust, a new limited series for HBO. The Horror of Dolores Roach on Amazon Prime at Mark Maron, Gene Yoon, Judy Reyes and Jeffrey Self as recurring characters. Butch Patrick to play Tin Can Man in Rob Zombie's Munsters reboot. The Last Drive-In with Joe Bob Briggs has been renewed for season five. Zelda Williams, daughter of Robin and an actor herself, will make her directorial debut with Lisa Frankenstein from Oscar-winning screenwriter Diablo Cody. Tom Swift canceled at CW after only five episodes. 
Time Traveler's Wife canceled at HBO after one season. Andrew Scott and Paul Mescal, Claire Foy, and Jamie Bell will star in Strangers. Magnum P.I. saved and renewed for two more seasons at NBC. As we mentioned, the Duffer Brothers are making a Stranger Things spinoff. They have launched Upside Down Pictures at Netflix. They will have the Stranger Things spinoff. Stephen King's Talisman, which they actually has a, a bit a little cameo in uh, Stranger Things Season 4. Um, one of the characters is reading the Talisman. And they will also make a new Death Note live action series and a new show from Dark Crystal TV show creator. Uh, Brian Cranston confirmed Showtime show Your Honor will end after Season 2. Evil renewed for Season 4 at Paramount+. Plus. Night Sky canceled at Prime after one season. Kingpin and Daredevil to appear in Echo TV show officially. Stephen Ewan joins Bong Joon-ho's Mickey 7, which stars Robert Pattinson. Reese Witherspoon and Will Ferrell to star in Nick Stoller's Untitled Wedding Comedy. Open, uh, Untitled Wedding Comedy. Open World Terminator Survival Game in the Works at Nacon, or Nacon, whatever, uh, Nacon. Uh, Julius Ono, director of Cloverfield Paradox and Loose, will direct Anthony Mackie in Captain America 4. This one's a big one here. Uh, Christian Slater, Alia Shotcat, Gina Davis, Adria Urjarno, Haley Joel Osment, Liz Carabell, Sierra, LaVon Hawk, True Mullen, Sal Williams, Chris Costa, and Kyle McLaughlin join stars Channing Tatum, Naomi Ackle, and Simon Rex in Zoe Kravitz's directorial debut called Pussy Island. Release is coming up. Scream 5 breakout star Melissa Barrero has a Netflix limited series out July 28th called Keep Breathing. Georgina Campbell and Bill Skarsgård horror film Barbarian hits theaters August 31st. Wonder sequel White Bird, A Wonder Story, hits theaters October 14th, directed by Mark Forster and starring Jillian Anderson and Dame Helen Mirren. Zombies 3 hits Disney Plus July 12th. Honor Society hits Paramount Plus July 29th. Harley Quinn animated show season 3 hits HBO Max in July, no official date announced. Sony's Dracula film The Invitation starring uh, Nathalie Emanuel from Game of Thrones and directed by Jessica M. Thompson hits theaters August 26th. Hocus Pocus 2 hits Disney Plus September 20th. Ghostbusters Afterlife sequel will be coming out December 2023rd. 13 Lives, directed by Ron Howard, who we just talked about, starring Colin Farrell, Viggo Mortensen, and Joel Edgerton, hits Amazon Prime August 5th. Godzilla vs. Kong sequel lands March 15th, 2024 release day. Dune Part 2 pushed back a month to November 17th, 2023. Wedding Season hits Netflix August 4th. Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles hits Netflix August 5th. Luck hits Apple Plus August 5th. So that's this the last couple of weeks. I'm going to save the two big ones for last, but we'll go through some of the other ones. Uh, Massimo Morante, co-founder of Italian rock band Goblin, who scored a lot of Dario Argento films, including Deep Red and Suspiria, has passed away at the age of 70. James Rado, star and co-creator of Hair, dead at 90. Mary Mara, ER, in Criminal Minds, actor dead from drowning at 61. Nick Nemerhoff, comedian, dead at 32. Joe Turkle, The Shining and the Blade Runner, dead at 94. Kazuki Takashi, Yu-Gi-Oh! creator, dead at 60. Lenny Van Dolan, veteran character actor known for Twin Peaks, passed away at 63. Gregory Itzen, Star Trek, and 24 actor, dead at 74. Okay, so the last two. First, we had James Conway, passed away at 82 years old. Legendary actor, uh, you know, Godfather Part 2, uh, Rollerball, um, fucking Thief, uh, Elf, the obviously. The program, <laughs> of course, one of our favorite football movies we'll talk about. You know, just another one that you're like, oh, shit, like, everyone's getting fucking old. Yeah. Like, it was just, yeah, it sucked. Your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, no, it's just, it was just like, oh, man, wow. And I mean, it's not like a tragic, like, he didn't, like, die a young man. He, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you hope everybody lives a, li- a nice long life. Mm-hmm. And, uh. It is one of those that stops you in your tracks and you see like the social media post and you're like, it's just deflating. It's like, oh. Yeah. Well, it's just, yeah. you're right. You said it exactly. You're just kind of like, you see it and you're like, oh, man. Like, it went, like, and it was totally like a Ray Liotta moment. You're like, oh, fuck, not him. And yeah. um, now Ray Liotta was a little younger, so that was a little more shocking. Um, yes. The next one, though, right around that same age, Tony Sirico, The Sopranos, Dead at 79. Wayne, I will let you take over this one. Oh, get the fuck out of here. Obviously, uh, the portrayal of Polly Walnuts in Sopranos definitely had a lot of the comedic relief and one-liners. Um, he had other roles, and he was he had, he had a small role in Goodfellas. 
uh, a lot of other mob related or you know organized crime movies. I don't know a lot of his like filmography and whatnot, and he may or may not have had some ties to some organized crime earlier in his life, but uh, just a really compelling character that uh, brought me a lot of joy to watch throughout the years, and it was really sad to see him pa- hear that he passed away. Yeah, I had it very similar like James Conn. You just like you scroll past it like, oh shit, like not not him now. Um, yeah, you know, a very memorable role uh, as Paulie on Sopranos. I mean, when you can, he, he basically could have dined off of that role for the rest of his life, and I'm sure he did because that's such it was such a high quality and biggest show in the world show that like everybody knew that character, regardless if you've seen all of it or even just an episode or two everyone knows Polly. uh they know they you know he, he's so big that they recently in the last couple of years he was what in a pistachio commercial or a mr peanut mm-hmm. commercial or something along those lines um basically when you go on youtube and he's got his own clip that's like 30 minutes long of his best one-liners or something you know that you've hit on something special yeah and i know it, it hit a lot of obviously a lot of the sopranos cast because uh uh christopher um uh, Moltisanti, uh, the actor, like he, um, Michael Imperioli. Michael Imperioli. He, yeah, they played off of each other a lot. Um, and it, like, it was just so good to see. And it's just, it's just sad, you know, it's just, but again, these guys are getting older. Everyone's, you know, health obviously comes into it, into it, uh, when you probably cross 70, I would say, um, a lot of the times. So it took me back to when James Gandolfini tragically passed away 10 years ago. And obviously, James Gandolfini's passing was a lot, much more shocking and heartbreaking because he was, yeah, a very young fifty, I believe. Something like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was definitely a lot more of a shocking moment than this. Not that you know, obviously, it doesn't lessen it at all. It's just that he was seventy nine years old, and if he had health problems, it makes sense that he, you know, uh, maybe uh, had some health issues from eating too many uh, uh, parm sandwiches. I don't know. I don't know what his, what his Italian diet was, but, uh, you know, Italian food could be a killer. Um, but yeah, so but what you know, a sweet, rest- sweet death it would be. <laughs> yes. Yes, it would. Give all this <laughs> rest in peace to James Conn, Tony Sirico and everybody else that we mentioned. Uh, again, there's a lot of names just because it's been like two or three weeks because the last episode we recorded, we didn't talk about anybody in that way. We left all the news and notes off. So, um, we appreciate, uh, you as fans listening to our show. Uh, we hope you enjoyed our 100th episode and look to you know join the next 100. Uh, this is also, we just passed our two-year anniversary, Wayne, so happy two years to us for being uh, on this podcast. Um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, we yeah. uh, really enjoy doing this for you guys every week. Uh, we hope you enjoy. Uh, Wayne, any final thoughts for the episode? Uh, it's nice to get back in the old swing of things. I love having guests on, but you know it's really good just chatting with you about the good, the bad, and the ugly that we're putting out, you know, <laughs> video and movie wise. Yep, definitely. I, I agree. It's, it's fun to get back into it. Um, all right, everybody. Well, thank you uh, for listening to a new episode of Now Showing with Mike and Wayne. All right. And the actor? Hasta la vista, baby. Hey, everybody. We're all going to get late. Oh, yeah!